So, I thought I should start by saying a couple things here. Turn that off. Because there were so many people that kind of got tripped up on this. And, and I feel a little bit bad because I didn't make a, a big deal of it in, in class. But those, those uh, formulas that, that Engel puts in that whatever it is, D24 or whatever, pay, you have to pay attention to both where they stem from, the diagram above, and also this, this dot. And I went back in this diagram and, and put these dots in in orange uh, so that it's a little more clear. But this is what I think several of you probably um, didn't quite get this, that you can't, on this problem, the reason of looking at this method or presenting it is you cannot, you cannot just go down here. And the reason you can't, I mean, you can do, you can start here, you can get the shear diagram, you can get the moment diagram. Okay, we've done that before. You can get, let's see, you could get this diagram by these points, right? You can calculate these areas and get these points, but look, you can't get that area. The way I got that area is I added it up from these two diagrams because you don't have the formula for that area. This area, and, and if you think about it, you'd say, oh yeah, come on. Uh, yeah, turn, turn that line on there a second. You know, here's a parabola. Now, now Engel's giving you this formula, right? There's his little box. Well, that doesn't mean it's going to be true if you take a box up, up here somewhere. I mean, these are totally different, different views, right? It's totally different pieces of the equation. And the equation, uh, all of these, the, the parabolic and the cubic equations, uh, changes a, I mean, the slope here. This is a very different situation than this up here. So this is, this is the two-thirds, one-third. This isn't. This is closer to half to half, right? It's not. So it, the point is, uh, you do have to be careful of that, of this little thing. And this is, the, this is the bugaboo in the whole deal. You can't get that area except by adding areas. And when you break it into pieces, then, oh, then you can. Because see here, this is zero. When this is zero, that's a vertex. There it's zero, that's a vertex. There it's not zero, so that's not a vertex. Now this little piece here, this is a vertex, but it's not a vertex for this whole thing because here the equation changes. You know, this, I mean, you can't tell. It looks like it's a smooth curve, but here it's pretty obvious. The equation has a, a bump in it there, and this would also change if you were doing that, if we went through and tried to uh, do that with the integration, you'd have to have, you know, you'd have to have one equation for this uh, space and one equation, the equation would change. You'd have two separate equations that you'd have to integrate, um, to, which is a bigger hassle than with the integration business because you have, you're like doing it three or four times, uh, you know, for different segments of the beam or each different equations. And we'll see at the, at the end of today, uh, uh, even when you do it by given equa formula equations, you have to pay attention to where you are in the beam because the equations do change. Anyway, so that's kind of a, uh, a little bit more explanation on that. Now, this one that we, we started through, I'll go through the example with this. The, the deal here, the reason this is important is that you, this is for a case where you don't know, where it's asymmetric and you don't know where the uh, slope is zero. If you knew where the slope was zero, you wouldn't have to do this. If it were symmetric, for example, any symmetrically loaded beam, it comes to the middle. The maximum deflection, wherever the maximum deflection is, that's where the slope is zero. I mean, they're, they're right above each other or below each other. So if you know where, if you know where the, if you know where the maximum deflection is, then this is, you don't need to do this. This is only uh, necessary in an asymmetric case. So that, you know, like, like this with these, these loads like that, or like this example. This one, this one shows a, a distributed load, and I think this is, isn't this like the next one? Yeah, so this is, <laughs> this is maybe worth paying attention to. This is, this is you know, shoot, he would give you an asymmetric one. Why don't we do a symmetric? <laughs> well, 
Hey, come on, symmetry is dull, right? Is it? Yeah, come on, this is the age of asymmetry. You gotta get with it um, and do some, some baseline shifts here. Uh, so this is all a technique to, f to find, the whole, the whole deal here is to find where, where that point is. And the reason you wanna know where that point is, is that's where that point is. You're really looking for the maximum deflection. You want to know what the maximum deflection is. You know, other deflections are interesting, but they're just not quite as interesting as a maximum deflection. So to find that point, this, that's the only reason for playing around with this diagram. The slopes in and of themselves are pretty uninteresting. There's just, you know, I mean, to know that the slope at uh, this point here, or this point here for that matter, was 762 radians per EI, that's, who cares? I mean, it doesn't really, it, that's, not, that's not really as useful a piece of information as knowing how much the thing is, is deflecting. That, that's what everything, that's a much more um, applicable piece of information. Then you can tell, well, if it's deflecting, it might run into a you know, bump on something or you'd hit your head on it or, you know, or whatever. Uh, more more uh, applicable piece of information than the slope. But you need that slope diagram to find the location of that. So that's the, that's the relationship there. Now, in this, this is the, the baseline, this, this formula here. Uh, and it is, it is a pretty slick little trick uh, to do this. There are, there are other methods that um, you can find in other textbooks. Uh, we we kind of were joking about how many there were. Conjugate beam is one. There's one where you, you take um, the moment diagram, pretend the moment diagram is the load diagram, and then calculate the moment for it, which means, I mean, you're doing over again, and you end up down here for the moment, right, if you think about that. But that's a, it's a little bit of work. I mean, I, I think it's probably more work than this, and it, it, to me, it's a little bit more abstract, maybe. And you have to find the centroid. That's why in if you look at those diagrams too, in uh, Engel, the area diagrams, he very politely gives you the centroid for those shapes. That's why he's doing it because if you had that centroid, then you'd know you'd find the area, you'd you'd use the centroid, you'd calculate the moment of this diagram uh, as if it were a load diagram, and you'd end up with this diagram. Yeah, you could you could do that, but it's to me a little bit more work than this. This is, this is maybe, um, and it, it, to me this method's a little bit more straightforward is you're, you kind of know where you are in the process. You're not, you're only making one kind of, kind of make-believe step here, arbitrarily picking a point. Whereas the other way they're, they're more, kind of more of a, what do you call it, and there's Zotz beam, and I don't know, it seems more philosophical sort of <laughs> maneuvering. Anyway, well, <clears throat> So the way this works out, here you've got one that's definitely asymmetric. In starting off, it would be a good idea to kind of look at it and get a sense of where the deflection is going to be maximum. And, and, and the sense would be, OK, look, if I took this away, if I dump that guy, this load is dead in the middle, right? 18 and 12 and 6 is 18. So this is symmetric. If that was the only load on there, then the deflection would be right under that load. It would be at the center line because it's symmetric. So what's making it asymmetric is this thing over here. Putting the load on that side is obviously going to shift the deflection to that, to that side, right? Uh, now, it, it's, not like, it's not like a limp string, is it? No. <laughs> the deflection is not going to be right under the moment. The, the maximum moment is here. That's easy enough to find. But the deflection is not going to end up right under that maximum moment. And the, the reason is because uh, the, the stiffness of the beam enters into it. it well, that's part of the reason, but it, it, it shifts it. Um, well, it's just not under there. I don't know. I can explain it too, too well, but it's, it, it uh, is influenced by other things, too. The, let's see. But it is going to tend toward that direction, right? This, is, this load's going to pull it over there. So you know it's probably to this side of this load. It's not over here. It's not dead in the middle. It's probably 
in here. And usually, uh, it, it will gravitate toward the center anyway. Even if I put, if this load weren't there and I put this load on there, it's not going to be in the center of that load either. I mean, let's play around with things a little bit. Here, put your, put your hand over here somewhere. Okay, well, of course, uh, with a little more force. Oh, down. Yeah, yeah, okay. downward. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, it's not deflecting right under his hand. It, it does, of course, this has got the dead weight in it too, which is pretty hefty. But, but it does kind of shift toward the center, right? You can imagine it's always going to shift toward the center, but it's not going to be right at the center. If the, if the load's asymmetric, it's going to shift toward the... Okay, so all that's just to say it's going to be in here somewhere. Now, in the, in the way this method works is you just assume uh, where, where the slope diagram, this diagram, is going to cross zero. You pick a point. And you, kind, you can pick it kind of close. I mean, it would, I, could have picked, I could have picked the center line, but I know that's wrong. So I think I picked this line, didn't I? Yeah, I did. OK, I picked, picked it to line up with this edge. So it's probably in here somewhere. It's probably maybe in here, but whatever. At least, I'm, at least I'm making some sort of guess. The other thing is to pick a point that's easy to calculate. Try to pick a point that's at the edge of something, at least that's dimensioned. Right? I could have picked a point right in there, but that's a little bit more trouble to calculate, although probably not very much. But at any rate, when I came down here, I'd have to break these into, into areas. You have to realize that as you come down, whatever, pick you, whatever point you pick, you're going to have to be able to sum areas on either side in the moment diagram. So by picking this point, okay, it's coming down here. When I get to the moment, I, here's the shear diagram. You know, you, you, you know how to build up these diagrams. There are the end reactions. I got the shear. I got the moment. Okay, now I pick this point. It's going to be the zero, the zero slope. Now I have to find the areas over here and the area on the, areas on the, the two side. That line is a divide line then, and I just have to calculate the areas. All right, this, there we've got a, a zero, so that's the vertex. So here's my little uh, two-thirds, right? Uh, base times height, that gave me that area. This one, well, now this one I probably fudged a little bit. That's really parabolic, right? Oh, in fact, here, coming up here, I can see this little triangle has an area of 0.5. So this goes from 60.5, is that right, to plus a 0.5. Somehow I just took a, I must have rounded it off to whole numbers, because this would have been at least 60. This is, this is a distance of 1, right? Yeah. So 1 time, oh, here we go, 60.5. Oh, this is a minus 0.5. Oh, it drops to 60. OK, so I could have, I could have if I wanted to be super accurate, maybe try to take the um, 60.25, and this would, have been, this would have been then 60.25 as the area. But you'll see it doesn't. It, you don't have to get too much closer than you know this. You're you're in the area of integers, I think, to be within two percent accuracy. If you carry it to whole numbers, it should work out pretty well. Anyway, so I I'm kind of fudging this to a rectangle, but it's not too much of a fudge, though. I mean, it's almost flat across. You know, I'm not very much off there. Uh, this one, this one is. A triangle, so I got that triangular area there. This one's a rectangle. This one's a big triangle. So you have to break it up into shapes that you can get the areas of, or or pretty pretty accurately guess or you know assume the areas. Like this one's not quite right. Okay, then that this side you add up. Okay, there that is. This side I add up. Okay, I guess these are those two numbers. These numbers then become the numbers on either side here. That's the side from the point you picked is zero, right? You picked this point is zero. Then the deviation uh, of this point is equal to the area here. So from that's what this is. From zero, here's zero up to 504 equals the total of the areas. That's what we've always done in diagrams, right? I mean, it's like up here. That's how I got this 60.5. It went from zero to 60.5 under that, that much. So you're doing the same thing, that area. So I, that gives me this point, and it also gives me, for that area here, this point, and I can kind of sketch in a curve. This is going to be, 
Yeah, actually all not the same curve. This over here, it's cubic, right? Up to there, there it then goes linear, so these are quadratic. But at this scale, they look kind of smooth. <laughs> They're just, and it's not so important to have it the perfect curve as just to understand so you can enough that you can draw these areas in there and that you can keep track of where it's crossing right so here's here's where I have it crossing now from this point on either side I again have to figure the areas I do it over again now I'm getting the areas of the slope diagram these areas this is the big this is the big a and b over here now I'm figuring except this is upside down what the heck okay uh, <laughs> this is this is the it's because Engel does it upside down, doesn't he? I don't know what's wrong with that guy. Sometimes I'm gonna slap him around a little bit, but wouldn't help. <laughs> um, all right, this is this is A and this is B. These are the two you're finding, A and B, to plug into this equation. So oh, what? come back here. So so here's the A. You know you got to you got to break it up into uh, into the shapes. This is this is going to be parabolic. Okay, we can get that one. This is and you pay attention to the vertex. That's a zero, so that must be a vertex. So we can get that one. Here's a rectangle under it. Here's a triangle. Here's a little triangle. Well, actually, okay, right. Hmm. Okay, this is not strictly speaking a triangle, is it? I mean, this is this is cubic. So actually, that's cubic. But come on, give me a break. This is so close to a triangle. What can the difference possibly be? I mean, you're, going, you're rounding it off the integers, for heaven's sakes. It's not, it's not, you don't have to get 100 decimal places here. So, so you, can, you can kind of fudge this into a triangle. You can fudge that into a triangle. That's pretty much here. And, and this works. You'll, you'll find that the curve is flat right where you're, where you're crossing the axis, generally. Right? So generally, this works out pretty well and you don't lose much accuracy. Okay, on this side, we got another, this is a cubic equation. You gotta make sure, this is probably the 5 eighths, isn't it? Or something, might have to look in the book. Uh, and this is a rectangle and a triangle. So you get these, these guys add up. They're, they're over here, there are the A's, and here are the B's. Okay, so I got A and B. These, these totals plug into this equation up here. So you take these totals, Plug them in up here. You're going to take the absolute value, so it doesn't matter which ones. Just subtract the, the, the smaller from the larger. Looks like I subtract, whatever. Somehow you subtract those two, so it comes out to be positive. And then um, divide it by the length, which was 36. And that comes out then in the shift. This is the amount of slope that you've got to shift it by. So here I drew it in in this dashed line. That's what that represents now. I mean, I calculated that 258. All the, now you have to redraw this diagram. It's essentially, all you've done, you take that heavy line, that, I mean the baseline, and shift it by that amount, 258. It just shifts upwards. And then you redraw the thing. So now this, this new baseline is this dashed line, but the curve's exactly the same. The curve's the same. So, so all these values, you just have to, on, on this side, you have to add the 258. On this side, you're subtracting 258. And, and sometimes they'll go one way, sometimes the other way. The, you just have to make it so it's balanced. It, it moves in the direction so that it balances, balances A and B. And you can generally tell which way that's going. I mean, you, well, yeah, certainly you can. Take away from the bigger and give it to the smaller, right? OK, now, some of these areas are the same, like this. This 444 hasn't changed. This was kind of outside of the realm of what got shifted. So this, this area is the same. This one grew bigger, right? It was, it's 12, right, that's 12? No, it's not 12. Yeah, yeah, where the heck is that thing? 11, I guess. That's why it's 66. This was 11 times 60. Okay, now it's 11 times something bigger, 318, I suppose. That became from 60, 60 plus this 258 is the 318. So now it's this area changed. This one got a lot bigger. So these two guys got a lot bigger. They were these dinky little things. These on the other side got smaller. They were pretty big, and now they're getting chopped off. So these two areas get smaller. This area is the same. That one was above, the, above that dashed line. So that one didn't change. Now, 
OK, so you just redo these, these few areas, add it up again, right? And now they should balance. Well, they'll almost balance. They probably won't dead on balance. And, and the difference, I mean, it could be one's absolutely right, the other's absolutely wrong, but you really don't know absolutely which one's which. And if you want to <laughs> cut your losses, you could just average them, would be kind of what I'd do. I mean, you could just take one or the other. It, it's not going to make uh, that much difference. The difference, I mean, look at the difference here, really. 74, 2, and that's less than 1%, right? It's at the scale of those numbers, that's not a very big error. So you don't have to worry about it. Um, if you got these two numbers and they were, there's a discrepancy of 10%, then, then you should stop and think, whoa, maybe I'm doing this wrong. Because, because they shouldn't be that far out. I mean, these are less, less than 1%. Right? What, is, what is that, anyway? Why don't you figure that out? <laughs> What's a percent error between these two? 20s, it, uh, it would be 20 out of 7,420. Yeah, it's less than, a, less than half a percent. So, OK, less than a quarter of a percent. Not very much. Anyway. So you take, now, um, what the heck, why do I need this number? That is the total from one side or the other, OK? Assuming it's a total from, from this side. That then becomes the value here, right? This area equals this deflection. So now I've got, actually, I've got two things. I've got the number that's going to give me the deflection. This is, this is in uh, kip feet cubed, and it's, not been, it's actually times or, or will have to be divided by EI. This is a deflection EI. So to get actual deflection, I've got to divide <laughs> off the EI to get deflection. So that's, what, that's what's going on there. It's also giving me, look at this here. Somewhere I better be able to figure out the feet. I kind of skipped over mm -hmm. this. You have to get the, when this shifted, you have to find the location here, right? And I did that by similar triangles probably. That's a, I assumed this to be linear and looked at similar triangles. So I had, uh, oh golly, I'd have to find these numbers. 240, this is probably down here somewhere. Here it is. It was this triangle, right? Three, 340, 342 went to 258 as six. Here we had a distance of six. There's a six, went to x. So I'm taking two similar triangles to find this x distance which turns out to be 4.5. 4 I had to do that to get those areas, obviously. But that also gives me then, let's see, 11 and 1, that's 12, and 4 is 16.5. So this is located at 16.5. So now you know the location. That's good to know. And, the, and this then gives me first this number in kip feet cubed, which then to get into inches, the feet cubed is going to have to be multiplied by inches cubed, 1728, right? 12 cubed. And then divide it by EI, both in inches. And that should get, if you put, no, let's say this plugs some numbers into it. For a 12 by 26, that's a, E would be 29,000 KSI in inches. Ooh, this was in kips. Okay, that's right. And, and um, um, moment of inertia of 204 inches to the fourth. So you crunch that out, and you get 2.17 inches. Wow. <laughs> and you can, you can be proud of that. And then you can maybe think whether it's right. 12, let's see, what would this be? Whether that's a reasonable number. Um, that would be, if we say L over some some factor is equal to, to what did we just say that was 2.17 and L is equal to uh, 36 inches so it, and one inches yeah oh, I'm sorry I say, oh, I say 36 inches yeah it should be then um, two point Uh, wait a minute, I've got it. My F's going to be upside down. I've got to say 
uh, 36 times 12 divided by 2.17 equals that factor, which is what? 199. And this is, I'm, I'm just determining whether this is a, a reasonable kind of deflection. And the way, way I'm doing that, I'm, I'm looking at the span over some, some factor equals this deflection. This was also in inches, right? This is. And this then, come back here. We had a, we, didn't we have some chart up here somewhere? Where'd it go? There, ah, here we go. So then you can compare it with what are, what are generally taken as acceptable deflections. And it would, uh, it's almost 200, so it would pass, it would pass that. If it's, if it's higher, I mean, the, the, the lower this number, the bigger the deflection, right? If I, if I increase the deflection, this number gets lower, right? So, so if I have a number lower than this, like 180 is lower, <laughs> I mean, I see how I can say this. It, this would be a bigger deflection than this. This would be, so it's in this range anyway, okay? It's, it's better, it's less than, it's less deflection than those two. It's more deflection than that one. It's a good bit more deflection than this one. So it would fail this criteria. It would even fail that criteria. It would pass that criteria. So that puts you in a range. At least it's not like, if you came out with this figure to be three, you know, you're three, come on, that's totally off the chart. Or if it came out to be a number of 4,000, you know, 4,000, 4,000. It's, it's got to be somewhere in this range to be believable or else something's really, unless you've got really bizarre, you know, you got something made out of rubber or I don't know what you've done. Okay, so that gives you a sense, a sense of the deflections so you can kind of see that that's a little bit big for this 36-foot span. It's a little bit big. It would have been better maybe... It's not going to be good enough for a floor, but it might be okay for a roof. Okay, so next method. You can do this uh, flat out by equations as well, uh, by superposition. If you have a, uh, a superposition means you add up equations. If I have an equation for, whoa, hey, example, this case, you, if you look in the back of angle, in those charts, it's a little, again, it's, he likes to make things a little bit cryptic, but I think the m number he writes in the middle on the bottom is the deflection at the center line. So all these symmetric cases, they're all going to have a maximum deflection right at the center line. So they have pretty straightforward equations for that maximum deflection right at the center line. 5 WL to the 433A4EI. Oh, yes. That's the one we derived, didn't it? The very first time we talked about this. PL cubed over 4080i, then these other ones, yeah, all right. Now, if I have this plus this, I can, I can think of the loads as simply superimposed. I mean, one load, I put one load on there, it causes a deflection. I put the other load on there, it, it adds to that deflection additively. I mean, they just add up. So I can l literally, at the center line where these equations are valid, I can simply add this equation and this equation, and I'd have the combined the combined thing. So, ah, for example, look at here. Here's one with, well, not quite with numbers, but <laughs> almost. Uh, here's, here's the combined case, right? A distributed load, one kip per foot, 20K point load. Uh, you, you look at this one, you could plug this into here and get a deflection. You plug this one into here, there's the P, and get a deflection. You add the two, and you've got the deflection. Oh, hey, it did do it. I forgot I had this in here. Okay, so there, there they are. Here's the one, 1 1.4 for the, um, uh, well, excuse me, <laughs> for this limit. There's the limit. We're taking that roof limit, I get, or 240, wherever that came from. So that's going to be our kind of touchstone. This one is for the distributed load, and this one's for the point low. There they are, they're separated. And this one goes then with that. You plug in the numbers here. This one comes over here, plug in the numbers. Don't forget, in both, this is interesting, which I pointed out before. Look at that. It's the same. Isn't that interesting? Amazing, because this is, this is in, uh, you see the feet cubed there, L cubed, but here it's to the fourth. You think, fourth, wait, wait. Fourth isn't cubed. 
We should maybe, no, no, don't get confused. Because although this is to the fourth, then you've got a, you got, that goes with that, a load, a W load that's in per foot. So assuming you've got, you know, this load in feet as well as this distance in feet, then you're back to cubed. So this factor is always inches cubed, 1728. All right, play that through with some beam here, dimension steel. I don't know what the 890 was. Oh, it's this thing, 1855. And you come out additively, whoa, look at that. What do you know? 1.41. Well, it's close. It's not, that isn't quite right, but it's pretty close. So that's pretty straightforward. That's a lot easier than, you know, going through a lot of diagrams and stuff. And this is typically, with most cases, you'd, you'd fall into this. You'd be able to, in fact, you know, if it's not too asymmetric, if it's not too far off, you could, you could get away with assuming that it's at the center load, at the center line. Because the load's not going to shift that far off the center line. Now, for, for asymmetric cases like these, this is, this is out of the uh, uh, steel manual. They have, and you can find these equations lots of places. Um, they, they'll give uh, for a variable load. See, this could be any length A, uh, and this is at any location A, these two. And then you get, you get equations. Um, that are in terms of A. Even for the end reaction, see, you could figure this out. Uh, for the maximum moment, you know, you get a little bit strange equation. Well, based on the, this, this thing, so this would have to plug in here. And for the deflection, well, it depends. Now you've got different curves for the deflection. You're going to have one curve under this. You're going to have a different curve over here. So you're going to have different, different equations depending where you are in the beam. If you've got it less than A, if you're in here somewhere, then you've got, you've got trouble. You've got a big equation. If you've got it x greater than A, x is out here somewhere, then you've got a different equation. And you could plug in. Now, here, you've got to know what x is. You could take, you could take x at the center line. If you, if you were just totally lost for what to do, it's not going to be that far off. You could take it. You could guess it at a little bit back from the center. I mean, it's this side of the center line. Like we guessed that last, the, the one before. You could kind of guess it, and you could put it in there. You could guess, you could sit there for a while, you know, oh, I'll guess this, I'll guess that, I'll guess that. And, you know, every time you guess one, you get a different deflection, and you find which one's the biggest. I mean, sort of trial and error, isn't it? But it might take a while. <laughs> might not be the best way to do it. And then if you, then if you combine these two, you know, you, you add the, you're going to add, um, one of these equations down here, to point, depending on, OK, this is right at the point load. That might be interesting, the deflection. Or this is deflection in where it's less than A, right? Less than A. And they only give you one case because, after all, you could just flip this around, and then it would be the other side, right? Um, anyway, there's that equation. So you could, if you combine these two, if you find, if you have a case that, like, you might just have a case like this that has a, a distributed load and a point load, and you want, to, you want to find the combined deflection, well, then you have to use an equation where the, at the same x. So you could, you could take these two, but you want to put the same x distance in for both of these equations. So I can take, say, say I want to say, OK, I'm going to take these two equations. Well, just like, actually, I think I take this example the exact same as this one, OK? This is uh, 12 and 6, OK? So maybe my x, I could pick an x in here somewhere, right? I could pick it 11, 12, I don't know, 14 or 15. I don't know what I might guess. And then I'd have to plug that as a guess. I'd have to plug that x. This would be on this side of this load. So that's x greater than a. That would be here, OK, x greater than a plug 14 or 15 or whatever I'm guessing into there, and then add it to this one. x is less than a, right? I'd be in here somewhere and plug it in there. As long as I get the same x in both equations, then I can add them together. And that would give me, that would give me the deflection at x. The only problem is, what's x? Right? You've got to guess x. And you could, you could just guess it, or you could be a little more refined about it. 
You could play, play this game, which is kind of clever. You could say, OK, I do know where x is going to be. It's going to be, remember when we drew this, x is defined at where the slope is 0. Where that's 0, that's going to be my x. That's it. So I just got to find that. I've got to find that point. And I can go from this equation. I don't have the, you know, the Steele manual. They don't even give you the equation for the slope. They figure, hey, if you want that, you're going <laughs> to go look somewhere else. You're not going to get it from us. So they're not even going to give you the equation for the slope. Uh, but they do give you the equation for the deflection. Well, you could take this, this equation and go backwards, right? Go up an equation by differentiating it. And differentiating is a little bit easier than integrating. I mean, at least you don't get a constant. You, you tend to lose things more than gain things. Um, so you could do that. That's what this does. OK, it takes these two equations. There's that one we saw, and here's this one. These are the two, the two equations. It puts them all, you know, expands the terms and in, in, uh, inputs the L where we know it. This is a value we know. OK, I pulled the EI out. OK, so I don't have to mess with the EI. And it gives me just a straight equation in terms of x. So the only thing I don't know is x here. All right, I can simplify that in a couple steps. And I get down to this. This is just algebraic. OK, so there's my equation in terms of x. That's then the slope, no, I'm sorry, that's a deflection equation for the combined case in terms of x for this, assuming the span, 36 feet locked in there. Hey. Hey, if nothing else, that would be a lot easier to plug in different values of x with, and and you know with the the trial and error. I mean, you could make it you could make a spreadsheet, write that equation into a spreadsheet, put in a bunch of numbers, you know, one through uh, eighteen or whatever, or even ten through eighteen by you know tenth increments, and just run it out, and you'd you'd see it. It would come up, right? You could graph it. It would be pretty. Well, um, or you could do it like this. This is this is more fun, really. Uh, you could get it precisely by uh, differentiating. So I differentiate this equation. There's a constant. That one disappears. The x disappears, and I get that as a constant. The, everything drops a power, right? I get this uh, and um, multiply by 2, right? Remember to do that and get that. And this one gets uh, multiplied by 3 and loses a power, and you get that. So you get that's pretty simple, really. And it might be fun to review your calculus. You haven't done it in a year or two. Um, you could brush up on that. And you get an equation that's, that you can maybe now solve. That's only a quadratic. So that you could plug into the quad. Oh, wait a minute. What did I do? I solve for uh, this. There's a square. I solve for 0. I, am, I don't have an equation yet. So I set this is the slope. I set this equal to 0. right? That, that defines it as the slope at the maximum deflection. OK, so that then that I can plug into the quadratic equation. Solve for x, and you get, like you always do from the quadratic, you get a couple of things. One's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> uh, 127, that's not even on the blackboard. But, but this one sounds pretty interesting. 16.4662. Whoa. OK, so then, I mean, th this, this was with the same numbers as, just for fun, the same numbers as this one. So that's that number. I mean, we were off a little bit, but not very much. 16. What was it? 16.466? And, and here I got 16.5. Oh, OK. Not too bad. But you, I mean, you could nail it with the, the equations if you were the type of person that liked to do that. <laughs> anyway, so there you go. You can, you, can, you can try that out on your homework problem, see if you can nail it. Uh, the, on the, whatever you do on that, a little tip I would recommend, if you, when you run through that, errors accumulate with these diagrams as you add them up. So if you get like numbers that are slightly, you know, like 2% or a little less than 2% off for the slope, you might correct them or at least sort it out before you go to the next step because you'll multiply your error potentially. But you should still, you know, like I did on this one. I mean, I, whoops, well, the other one, the example, I was easily within the range of accuracy with just integer numbers. It's not like you have to carry these things out to 100 decimal places. It's just within the range that things are on the beam, the scale of it is it's in thousands. You can easily just deal with integers and come out OK.
So, wow, hey. Man, I'm early. I guess I'll have to sing a song or something? No. Okay, you can, you can go early. There you go. Have fun. Have a nice week.